Okay, welcome to uh, lecture two, real analysis. Uh, last time we, uh, in lecture one, started by discussing some preliminary uh, tools that we'll need to construct uh, the real numbers. Uh, we started by constructing the rational numbers, and if you recall, the way we did that was we defined sets and relations, and a couple of uh, important uh, relations are uh, equivalence relations. Uh, another idea that uh, you can define using relations is the idea of a function, and we'll say more about that. Uh, you'll see more examples of that later. The idea of an equivalence relation is uh, is basically a way of grouping together objects in a set that you want to consider as being equivalent. And so when we defined the rational numbers, we defined them as equivalence classes of certain objects. And uh, because this is the way we grew up learning about rationals, those objects are named uh, by these symbols, P over Q, for instance, right? Like four-fifths, one-thirds. But the way you should think about them formally is as an object that represents a whole class of things. Okay, so the uh, the first example of that might be um, one example of that might be the class one half, which contains a bunch of things in it. What were those things? They were they were pairs. They were ordered pairs. One two is an element in this class. But what's another thing in this class? Two comma four. What's another ordered pair in this class? Three, six. There's a bunch of them. I won't write them all down. Okay. Okay. These all represent the same thing. And of course, you grow, grew up realizing that, or grew up learning uh, fractions this way. You grew up uh, saying, oh, I could call this class one half, but I could also call it, um, I could also call it, uh, two, four, or three, six. These are all names for the same thing. Okay? Okay. So, uh, and, and what is the equivalence relation? Well, it's just the usual cross ratio that you're used to thinking about. So here, Pn equals Qm is just the cross ratio you get by, comp uh, this is the way you grew up learning about how to tell if fractions were equivalent. You take the cross, you cross multiply three times four and two times six and, six and check if they're equal, okay? Okay, and, and so this is in fact an equivalence relation which satisfies three properties. What are the properties? Reflects, uh, the reflexive property says that one half better be equivalent to one half, okay. Uh, the symmetric property is the second property and that says what? about, let's say, two things that are in, in this uh, class. Yeah, if one-half and two-fourths are in the same class, then two-fourths and one-half are in the same class. Okay, that's a very obvious property you'd want to be true about an equivalence relation. And then the last property says that if a first thing is equivalent to a second thing and a second thing is equivalent to a third, then the first should be equivalent to the third. Okay, very natural properties for an equivalence relation. Okay, so this is where we ended last time. We uh, ended by constructing the rationals as a bunch of classes. Okay, so uh, here's what we want to do today. We want to talk about the arithmetic structure of the rationals. And we want to understand in what sense does, do the rationals extend the integers? So uh, let's, uh, let's begin. We can uh, begin by uh, thinking a bit about what this means. Let's roll up the boards here. So our plan, our plan then is to talk about properties of Q. Q is our symbol for the rational numbers. And uh, in particular, we want to talk about its arithmetic and its order properties. 
And we'll see that that leads into a discussion of the, the algebraic structure of Q, which uh, is naturally a field. So the first thing to, to ask yourself is, what do you mean by addition? And just to set the stage a little bit, let me remind you that all we have right now, as we've defined the rationals, is a bunch of classes, right? So here is the whole universe of rational numbers. And inside this universe uh, are classes of objects. So, you know, there's all these fractions, which I'm writing instead of as ordered pairs, as fractions. Right, there's a whole bunch of these. Um, uh, Etc. Okay, but some of these are equivalent, so we've grouped them in classes. Right, some of these are equivalent. <laughs> oh, these are definitely not equivalent. <laughs> Some of these are equivalent. <laughs> Let's make sure my picture says, uh, speaks truth. And these are, of course, equivalent to other things, but they, they're, I mean, there's, there's probably lots of other things in here, right? This is in some class of, of, of stuff, right? There's other things in here, but these are classes. Okay, great. So. Here's the thing we want to do now. We want to talk about addition. How are we going to define uh, addition? So um, let's take a stab at it. What does it mean to add this class to this class? What would that mean? Well, let's, let's, let's suggest a definition. Here's one possible definition. And I'll just tell you right off the bat, it's, it's a bad one, OK? <laughs> this is a bad definition, OK? But you tell me what's wrong with this definition. Um, how about, uh, oh, this is uh, probably um, a, a very common way to define addition if you're in grade school. Uh, this is a way a lot of people get wrong. All right, let's define addition to be add the numerators and the no denominators, OK? You can't stop me from defining addition this way. <laughs> OK? Now, um, wh what you could do is point out to me why this is not a good definition. Why is this not a good definition, Willie? OK, what Willie is saying is that the, th this definition has a following problem. Aside from the fact that it seems to be perhaps meaningless, that's another issue, it has a more basic problem. And the more basic problem is it's not what we call well-defined, okay? So let me just illustrate with an example. If I tell you to add, to add the fraction 1 half and 1 third according to this rule, you will get 2 fifths, okay? Remember, these are just objects. We don't really, I'm not associating a meaning to them. I'm just using this rule. Uh, but what's, what's, what is one half? It's also equivalent to lots of other things, but in particular, it's equivalent to two fourths according to our definition of uh, rational numbers, right? But what if I now add this to the same fraction, one third? What will I get? Three, seven. But you can immediately check that even though these two things are in the same class, these two things, the result is what? They are not equivalent according to the equivalence relation. Are you with me? It's a basic problem. You want, anytime you're dealing with an object that's defined in terms of classes, the definitions you use should not depend on the representatives you pick. OK? Should not depend on the representatives you pick. So um, another example might be um, equivalence classes of college students, right? One, one way to, to define equivalence relation is to look at all the freshmen, all the sophomores, all the juniors, all the seniors. Class by class, there are four classes, and these are equivalence classes, OK? And I want it to be the case that any time I define something in terms of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, that 
the answer should not depend on the representative chosen, right? Okay. So, for instance, I might I might ask something about college students. I might ask, uh, how many classes have you taken? Right. There's a question I could ask of uh, a college student, and the answer might depend on whether you're which class you're in, but it shouldn't depend on which person you pick in the class. And of course, that, that, that particular question is not well defined, is it, for the equivalence classes of college students? Because a freshman might take eight courses or 10 courses, <laughs> depending on what, you know, wh wow insane you are, exactly. OK, OK. Um, what is a question whose answer is well defined for the classes of students? Freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. It's an example of a question whose answer is well defined. What? Jenny? What year will you graduate? What year will you graduate? <laughs> <laughs> there seems to <laughs> there seems to be some uh, some concern about that. But for the most part, what year you're predicted to graduate has a well defined answer. Are you with me? Okay. We want the same thing for our definition of. Uh, of uh, rational addition, addition of rationals. Okay, well, so that's a bad definition. It's not equivalent, and what uh, the message here is the the um, addition is not well defined. This particular addition is not well defined. So just to be very explicit, I'll say what we want. We want a notion of addition that does not depend on the representatives chosen. Does not depend on the representatives of uh, chosen. Okay, and uh, this is uh, what we say uh, when we mean. This is what we mean when we say well-defined. Addition of classes is well-defined. We want addition of the classes to be well-defined. Okay? Okay, so let's suggest another notion. How about this one? Here's another dif different notion of addition. We might look at, uh, how about this? Let's let a, a over B plus C over D. I'll define that to be uh, 0 over 1. There's a definition. Is it well defined? How would you check? You're, you're smiling at me. You're smirking at me because. Uh, y this is not the notion of addition you're used to. But I just want to know, is this notion of addition well-defined? I'm adding any pair of fractions, and I always give back the same class. So does the answer depend on the representatives chosen? No, in fact, the answer doesn't even depend on what, what classes you pick, right? Which is even a, a, another issue, OK? It's well-defined. So this is well-defined. You can check. I'll let you check this. It is well defined. But uh, it has a problem, and that is it's meaningless. It's kind of a boring definition, but boring. It's uninteresting. It would be not uh, doing us very much good if this definition didn't have some meaning to us. OK? OK. So let's. Uh, Let's define addition uh, in a meaningful way. So here's the good definition. And this is the one we'll use throughout the rest of this course. A over B plus C over D equals, everybody should know this, good, AD plus BC over BD. OK, so this is a notion. And by the way, remember, uh, in mathematical communication, 
more so on your writing of mathematics than on the board work here, but I will try to do it in the board work. Uh, everything should be expressed in a complete sentence or a thought, right? So this is uh, this plus this equals this, right? Equals is the verb, and, there and I'm finishing the thought here with a period, okay? Notice I've tried to do that here and here as well. Okay. Okay, very good. So this is the definition. What would I have to do, and you're going to do this on your homework, what would I have to do to show this is well-defined? To show that it's well-defined, I want uh, to do what? I must show what? Okay, good. So two members from the same equivalence class will give you the same answer. There are lots of, of course, uh, uh, several classes we're talking about, so I might change the, cla uh, the, the representative here. I might change the representative here as well. And I want to know, is the answer going to be in the same equivalence class when I do that? So how do I say that mathematically? So mathematically, we will... Uh, Here's what you want to verify on your um, homework. So to show that it's well-defined, I must show the following. If AB is equivalent to uh, A prime, B prime, and what? CD is equivalent to C prime, D prime, then What? <laughs> yeah, that's right. AD plus BC comma BD is equivalent to A prime, D prime plus B prime, C prime, B prime comma B prime, D prime, period. This is continuing this sentence. I must show this. So this is our goal, OK? So in your homework, you want to uh, start off with these uh, statements. And, of course, then that will yield a certain relation, right? You take the cross, do cross, multi uh, cross multiply and get a certain uh, uh, property of uh, that A, B, A prime, B prime must satisfy. Similarly for here, and you want to work through the, the consequences to show that these are, in fact, equivalent. Okay? So that's one of your homework assignments. It's, uh, it's tedious, but uh, it's, it's good to do such an exercise at least once in your life, okay? So you know what, what, what foundations you, you rest on. Okay, that's addition. What about um, multiplication? Well, by now, of course, you know that we're trying to create uh, arithmetic with some meaning, and you've already learned some of the meaning of multiplication. So it makes sense to do this the way you learned in grade school. So if I want to multiply two fractions, I'll define this to be what? AC over BD, the class of, right? Okay, and again, I want you to check that this is well-defined. Also on your homework. Again, that means you're going to have to convert this statement into a statement about pairs. Okay, ordered pairs. Okay, good. We have an arithmetic, and it's good news that, that it does, in fact, uh, the addition and multiplication are well defined, and there's a reason for that. It's because it has a physical meaning, right? The one you grew up learning. Okay. But now we've defined rationals in terms of integers, just integers. Uh, but I want to know in what sense does does this new construction uh, uh, extend the integers? And so um, here's a question then: How does Q extend Z? 
So in what sense does Q extend Z? Well, the first thing you have to tell me is which elements of Q correspond to, the, to a particular integer, the integer 5? What class of fractions is equivalent to 5 as an integer? 5, 1. 5 over 1. Good. So here's uh, one thing uh, y y you want to say then is 5 over 1 corresponds to 5. n over 1 corresponds to n. And that correspondence would be kind of uninteresting if it weren't also for the fact that the arithmetic also extends, right? So what you want to check is, you want to check that uh, the, the set of all classes n over 1, where n is an integer, you want to check that this behaves like z does. behaves as z. Okay, this is an informal way of saying that this subset of the rationals is isomorphic to z. If you've taken algebra, some of you have taken 171, we're just talking about isomorphism. If you haven't, ah, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, but you want to you want to check that in fact that this this correspondence here n over 1 uh, corresponds to n. Uh, so the correspondence, so make this a sentence, I'll say the correspondence is this, period. And you can check that, in fact, if you add n plus a, n over 1 plus m over 1, you get n plus m over 1. And if you multiply n over 1 times m over 1, you get nm over 1. Okay, these are the things you would check. N very easy to do. Okay, so what do we have now? We have a picture that's no longer looking like this, but now somehow uh, has a structure that tells me how I can add certain elements, multiply elements, and some special classes of these happen to be behave just like the integers do. Okay. That's good news. Now, um, now what? Well, OK, I have this thing, Q, that extends uh, the integers. But uh, the integers also have another property. What's another, what's another feature of the integers? Yeah, yeah, there's an ordering of the integers. OK? So um, Z has an order. So I have to talk about what an order relation is. And we want to know, does Q have an order as well? And of course, you grew up learning about what the order might be. But let's just think uh, carefully about how we might define such an order. So help me out here. I want to define a, a notion of order. Uh, that would be consistent with the kind of order, the ordering we think of for integers. You know, 2 is less than 5, and minus 7 is less than minus 3. First of all, what is an order? I'll give you a hint. It takes two things in, and it describes some kind of relation between the two. So what is an order? It's a relation, good. And what property should it satisfy? So an order on a set S is a relation. And we usually write it, uh, not surprisingly, by a little caret, OK? It's a relation we'll call less than. We'll, we'll use that symbol, satisfying some properties. What properties should an order relation satisfy? I'll give you a hint. There are two properties it must satisfy. Jenny. 
Uh, what do you mean by anti-symmetric? Ooh, interesting. Okay, yeah, so that's actually uh, very closely related to uh, the property I'm about to write down. There's one other thing that could be true. A is less than B, B is less than A, but that, those are not the only things. What else could be true, Steve? They could be equal. They could be equal. So we'll call this the uh, law of trichotomy. So the law of trichotomy says that exactly one of these things is true. So uh, for, so if X and Y are in the set S, uh, exactly one of these is true. Okay, I haven't left myself enough space here, but the, the three things are X less than Y, X equals Y, Y less than X. Okay, that's the first property. And what's the second property? What do you think should be true, Emil? Transitivity. Transitivity, I've heard that word before. What does it mean? Good. So we'll call this transitivity. Uh, and you've seen this before, but I'll write it down. If x, y, and z are in s, then, uh, and if x is less than y, and y is less than z, then x is less than z. These are two properties. And just to make sure that this is uh, a sentence, uh, this should probably be a comma or maybe a semicolon because I've just finished saying one thing and I have another property here, and two. Properties one and two, period. Okay. Okay, good. If you have an order, on S, then you call S an ordered set. So here's another uh, way to say the same thing. An order on a set S is relation. Um, so if you have this, we'll say we'll call S an ordered set. If it has an order. Okay. Okay. Very good. So um, what is the ordering on Z? So here's an example. In Z, in, in the integers, what's an order? Ooh, OK. A is less than B if B minus A is positive. I like that, but what is what is positive? What is great, but greater depends on an order. Okay, so you define order in terms of positive and positive in terms of order, and we want to avoid that. But that was a nice try. But you have the right definition, so we just have to decide what positive means. What is positive? What does it mean for an integer to be positive? Remind, tell me your name, Keith. Okay, we haven't defined absolute value, but and, and you guys are, I know you're, you're, you're trying to define positive in terms of other things, but why not just say what positive is? What is positive? Which is? What's C plus? Good, let's just, just, just write down a set, okay? So in Z, we're gonna say an integer, um, We'll say, uh, um, okay, I'll write this. M is less than N if N minus M is positive. That's correct definition. And what positive means is, i.e., i.e. just means, in other words, in the set, one, two, three, four, five, dot, dot, dot. Okay, just, we'll just declare those creatures to be the positive ones. Okay, you can't stop me from doing that. Okay, just try, just try. Okay, here we go, good. So this is Z, this is uh, what we mean by uh, 
positive, and this is what we mean by one is less than the other. How do you think we're going to do this in Q? How do you think we're going to do this in Q? By the way, there are many other notions of order you could consider, right? I mean, I, we just gave one, but there are lots of other ways to order the integers. Um, and you might enjoy thinking about how you might do that. Um, you're going to explore some notions of order on your homework, not today, this week's homework, but next week's homework. Um, there's a, a notion of uh, dictionary order. So maybe I'll just do this as an example. And Z cross Z, these are ordered pairs of integers. We can declare AB to be less than CD uh, uh, if something is true. Well, let's see. So the dictionary order says, in, uh, first you check the first element, and then you check the second. Okay, so uh, we'll say that A, B is uh, less than C, D if A is less than C, or if uh, A equals C and B is less than D. So if one of these conditions is true, and this is another a notion of an order, it's called the dictionary order for obvious reasons. Everybody with me? I guess this is not a state sentence, it's just a, a statement about what we call this order. Bonnie. Ooh, excellent question. Well, how would we answer that question? We don't know what the complex numbers are yet, but for those who perhaps do, <laughs> what, uh, would this dictionary order work for the complex numbers? Well, first of all, does it satisfy this trichotomy relation? Sure. Uh, d is it transitive? No? What would keep it from being transitive? You're just checking dictionary order. There's no reason it's not transitive, right? So it, it, would, it would work for the complex numbers as well. I mean, if you're thinking complex numbers as pairs of reals, right? So in fact, your homework do you ask, asks you to think about this, OK? It's an order. OK, uh, good. What about Q, then? What will we say about Q? How will I define an order on the rationals? Well, how about doing something very similar? So um, we're going to say m over n is positive. If we, we probably so by similar we mean we probably should say what we mean by positive, and then we'll say one fraction is less than another fraction if this one minus this one is positive. So how can we define positive? Yes. Oh, yes, excellent question. The question was, uh, do we know how to subtract two rational numbers? Uh, we, will def we, we will define uh, subtraction as adding the negative of, where negative is multiplying by minus 1. And so we know how to multiply two uh, rationals. And we will associate to minus 1 the rational minus 1 over 1 and perform the multiplication that way. Yeah, I won't do that out, but we'll assume we're going to do that in the, in the natural way. So in particular, what that means is anytime you have a rational, uh, if you want to subtract two rationals, that's the same as adding minus c over d and just treat minus c as an integer. We know how to multiply negative numbers that are integers. Okay, excellent question. So how would you help me define a fraction as being positive? 
just use your intuition. Yes, tell me your name. Uh, Drew. Drew. Okay, so uh, look at MN and ask, uh, and say this is positive if MN what? Good. This is another way of saying positive because MN minus zero is in that set. Okay, but we, we know what this means for Z already. Okay, great. Uh, w there is a little bit of a concern here though that we didn't have when we were talking about the integers. We just made a definition involving the rationals. We've just made a definition. What's, a, what's one thing you should worry about when you make a definition about a bunch of equivalence classes? Good, you should always, you should train yourself to thinking, every, you know, if I have some object that's a bunch of equivalence classes, uh, is it well-defined? And uh, I'll let you check this. It's a well-defined definition. Uh, we'll do this without writing it. What do I have to do to check that it's well-defined? Well, you give me another fraction that's in the same equivalence class, let's say P over Q. If M times N is bigger than zero, is P times Q bigger than zero? Well, we know P N equals Q M. That's, a, that's the uh, condition, and if M times N is bigger than zero, you can check that P times Q will in fact be bigger than zero. Involves a little bit of work, but check that you can do it, okay? Th these are some of the things you might do as you, when you go home and review the notes to check your understanding. It is well-defined. Okay, good, and then say MN is bigger than M prime, oops, less than M prime N prime if uh, M prime N over N prime minus M over N is positive. Positive. Sorry, I gotta say, do this here. Okay, good, so um, uh, we're being very careful at first uh, to define these rationals, but once we have these condition, uh, these properties, we'll just start using them without worrying about um, going back to ordered pairs. Let me mention, we sometimes write this symbol, y is bigger than x, that's the symbol we use, uh, for x less than y. I'm already using the, the words less than and greater than to, th to think about these symbols because they come from our uh, notion of order that we're, we've grown up with. And we'll also write, sometimes we'll write uh, x less than or equal to y. Notice the, the line below the less than symbol to mean, um, what does this mean? Okay, or x is less than y, or x equals y. Law of trichotomy would make it equivalent to what, uh, what you just suggested. Okay, very good. So we've just uh, defined what we mean by uh, order on Q. Okay, so stepping back from uh, what may appear to be a, a little bit tedious, but we're being careful here because we're building the foundations. We no longer have this picture, do we? Now there's a way to, uh, to think about the rationals the same way we think about the integers. We think about the integers as ordered, living on some kind of line, perhaps, where this is to the left of this if this is less than this. Right? So the rationals actually live on such a line as well. So let's think a little bit about what, uh, what that looks like. So a new picture of Q. We can think about it as 
you know, here are the integers. So let's use some different colors here for fun. Right? 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2. We have this notion of order. And uh, there are some rationals here. And they, you can check that, for instance, 1 half is less than 1. So it belongs here. And it's bigger than 0. 1 quarter is between these two in the order, etc. Right? 5 fourths minus 1 over 2, etc. Minus 4 thirds. OK? And there are a lot, more, a lot of more points here as well. Yes, don't make me write them all down. But there are a lot of them, and we'll answer the question of exactly how many there are in a few lectures. OK? <laughs> OK, so we have a new picture. And guess what? This picture is good enough to answer some questions. Right? So Q, in some sense, is good enough to solve some, uh, some, some questions we might be, be wondering about. So for instance, if I have three cakes and I want to divide them among five people, I might be interested in equal shares for everybody. And so three cakes have to satisfy five people equally. Then I'm interested in the answer in solving this equation, right? Is there an integer that solves this equation? No. Is there a fraction? Yeah. In fact, it's clear what that fraction is because of the, the, the rule I just erased, right? The multiplication rule, cross multiplication, we'll s we can see that x equals 3 over 5 satisfies this equation, solves this. Why? This is 5. It's the same as 5 over 1 times 3 over 5. And these multiply, and you get 15 over 5, which is equivalent to 3 over 1, which is 3. Right? This, is, this is just the arithmetic you learned in grade school. Okay? But it's on firm foundations now. Now, from here on out, what I want you to do, unless you're asked a, a problem that is actually foundational, you can just assume that we know the properties of the rationals. I'm not going to ask you to go back to working with ordered pairs. Just work with fractions as you're used to. Okay. So we have the rationals. And they're good enough to answer some things. But they're not good enough to, uh, to solve all equations of this form. Here is uh, another example. Um, what about x squared equals 2? claim it's not good enough to answer this question. And uh, let's, in fact, see why. Um, I will do that above. So, so some of you have seen this uh, proof before, perhaps in discrete mathematics. But I want to uh, do it for the benefit of everyone who has not seen it. Uh, and you have a homework that's, that's very similar, but in some ways different. So this may elucidate some points you, you hadn't thought about before. So here is a, this is a, 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 a fact that we will prove as a theorem. There is no solution. x squared equals 2 has no solution in Q. Another way of saying it is, this is a way you've often heard it said, is square root of 2 is not rational. Okay, and I'm avoiding saying that here because we haven't defined the square root of 2. Okay? All I'm saying is, in the rationals, there's no solution. So uh, here's a proof. Uh, it's a classic proof uh, by contradiction. And uh, if you're going to do a proof by contradiction, it is customary 
in mathematical writing to tell the reader you're about to do a proof by contradiction, by, by writing proof and then parentheses by contradiction. Now, you'll notice I've put a period here. Uh, this is not a complete sentence, but this is convention. This is just customary mathematical writing. Okay, so it's okay to do this. Okay. Proof by contradiction. Okay, so what is a proof by contradiction? Well, the way a proof by contradiction normally goes, you start off by assuming that the thing you're trying to prove is false and show that leads to a problem. And if, it's, if it leads to a problem, then the thing you started with, which is the opposite of what you're trying to prove, couldn't have been uh, false, so it had to be true. Okay, that's sort of the basic plan. So uh, let's just illustrate with this example. X squared equals 2 has no solution. What is the, uh, uh, if, if this is not true, then what statement would I be starting with? Good. Assume that there is a solution in Q has a solution in Q. Okay. This is the way to start. Uh, and now I will change this statement into some uh, to a, a more formal statement, i.e., let's say x equals p over q. Are you with me? What else should I remind the reader of about p and q if I'm talking about fractions? Good, where P and Q are in Z. Okay? The shorthand equals and the shorthand uh, contained in, these are, these are generally acceptable for mathematical writing, even writing on a piece of paper, okay? Okay, very good. Now, uh, I claim there's one more thing I might want to assume here, but it's not going to be obvious to us off the bat that I'm going to need this, okay? So what I want you to uh, do is leave a little space and assume um, that something else is true. Something else is true, okay? But just to motivate how you might begin this problem yourself, you might not be able to see what, uh, what's coming. Okay. So if you're solving this problem yourself, you'll start by contradiction because now you actually have something concrete to work with, x equals p over q. So what does that mean? Well, that means that p over q squared equals 2. Right? With me? OK. We know how to work with fractions. We can assume all the arithmetic properties that we've talked about before. So this means, and another way to say that is hence. Uh, what does this mean? What is p over q squared? p squared over q squared. And if I use cross multiplication, what do we get? p squared equals 2q squared. In mathematical writing, you have to know something about your reader, but we're assuming your reader knows how to work with integers and fractions. And so making the jump from here to here is probably OK. The reader can probably reproduce this argument, right? So you don't need to show all the steps if you assume your reader understands what you're doing. OK? OK, good. p squared equals 2q squared. So what can I conclude about the number p? It's even because it is divisible by 2. Ah, then p uh, is even. And uh, I'll write, say it this way because this might be a better way of thinking about it. It's divisible by 2. Why is p even? There's a little bit of a jump here. Yes? Excellent question. The question was, are we going to say first that p squared is even? And uh, the answer actually depends on, a little bit on, uh, what, whether you think that's an important fact. Okay? 
Some of you made the jump here very quickly. But I, I claim it's, it's actually a, a little bit of a jump that you might want to help the reader with, OK? So remind me your name. Maya. Maya is suggesting we should tell the reader that there's an intermediate step. And I agree with this. The first step is to notice that if something equals twice something else, it's that something that you're noticing is even. P squared is even, correct? Now, how do we make the jump from that to the fact that P is even? Yes? OK, yeah, so I mean, if you want, you could go all the way back to um, uh, unique factorization of integers into primes, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it's helpful to think about that if you really want to. But uh, another way to say it is uh, then p is even. And here's, here's, here's one way to justify it. You might say, because if it were odd, if p were odd, p squared would be odd. Or another way to say it is, if p had a factor of 2, p squared would have a factor of 2. Right? Uh, sorry, if, sorry, if p squared had a factor of 2, OK, then p would have to have a factor of 2 as well. OK, then p is even. Good. Now, what does this mean? So I can write P as what? If it's even. It's twice something. I like M because it, uh, the letters M and N are often thought of as integers. But if P equals 2M, what does that imply? Hence, P squared equals 4M squared. And what does that imply? 4m squared equals what? 2 skew squared. Yes, question. Ooh, excellent, yes. Um, these are all good things. In fact, uh, you know, the, the process of doing a proof, you often re realize things that you need to add later. And so this is a, a quite good example of something to clarify your writing. In fact, this would not be a very good proof if we didn't say that. So thank you for pointing that out. So we should probably insert here where m, for some m in z, for some m in z. Thank you. Hence, p squared equals 4m squared, and 4m squared equals 2q squared. OK, we're almost there. What does this mean? We, we feel like we're going somewhere, I, th I think. If not, you're, you're, this is at least what you would do to play around with the problem to get a feeling for what's happening. But what, what does this mean? 4m squared equals 2q squared. Then m, 2m squared equals q squared. OK, then. This kind of looks like something we've seen before. What can we say about Q? Ah, then Q is, OK, now we maybe you should tell the reader first that Q squared is even, hence Q is even. You've made this argument once. You probably don't have to make it again up there, OK? Hmm. Hmm, I feel like I'm going in circles. P is even, Q is even. Haven't reached a contradiction yet. What could I do? Make the assumption that Q and Q have no common factors, and then if they both even, you have a common factor of 2 and 2 is just 2. Ah, now why would I want, how, how, first of all, why is that true? Can, why can I assume that P and Q have no common factors? Because what? OK, yeah, if they did have common factors, you know because of the equivalence of fractions that you could make it equivalent to one that didn't by canceling the common factors. So assume that P and Q 
are in, we say, lowest terms. This is the key ingredient we need. Uh, in other words, have no common factors, i.e., have no common factors. Here's where we're uh, really using the fact that uh, we can pick whatever representative we want. We might as well pick a good one. And then this would give us a contradiction. Uh, then uh, this contradicts um, the fact that P and Q uh, the are in lowest terms. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that the assumption that x squared had a solution yielded a logical impossibility, a contradiction. Therefore, what? So um, x squared equals 2 has, must, have, must have no solution in Q. Okay. Now, uh, when you get more sophisticated, uh, you're going to assume the reader understands when you do a proof by contradiction, you're just trying to get a contradiction and you're ending the proof there. But at least for the first few weeks of this course, you should probably remind the reader that you've reached the contradiction. Okay. Later on, you may, you may not need to write this as much, but try to do it at first just to get in the habit of thinking about the reader. The way we'll think about this course, by the way, is each time you're writing a proof, think, that, think about writing the proof for a person who is two weeks behind you in this course. Okay, So there are things they don't know that you know, and you want to emphasize the important points. Uh, often we end our proofs with a, uh, a symbol. Books do this. Or you can sometimes use the letters QED. Books also do that as well. OK. OK. Very good. So uh, we have the rationals. They have an order. They have an arithmetic. Uh, they solve. They're good enough to solve some equations, but not others. And uh, in order to try to figure out what it is that um, uh, that characterizes the rationals, we'll have to talk about some, uh, some properties they satisfy. So last thing I want to talk about today is that Q uh, has an algebraic structure. It's called a field. Okay. So what does it mean for Q to be a field? Well, uh, you can check that the rationals satisfy a bunch of properties. And any time you have rationals that satisfy a bunch of properties, of these properties, it's called a field. Okay, These are all in your book, so I'm not going to write them all down. But the idea is a field is a set with two uh, operations. The operations are uh, traditionally denoted by plus and times. And you'll, you'll notice there are five properties for addition that mimic the five properties for multiplication. OK? Closed, you'll see the, the actual definition in your book. Property of being closed means if you add two things, you're still in the set. OK? Commutative means A plus B equals B plus A. Associative means you can group in any, in any collection you want. A, if you do A plus B first and then add C, it's the same as if you add A to B plus C. The additive identity is what leaves uh, a particular element unchanged. A plus a zero element is A. And additive inverse means that there's something you can add to a particular element A to get the identity. Okay. Multiplication, exactly the same properties, except possibly which one? Yeah, M5, that axiom is slightly different. You have to worry about the zero element. And finally, Addition and multiplication should intermesh in some way. What way should they intermesh? Well, a, a multiplication should distribute over addition. So for the rationals, what is the, um, what are the, uh, what's the identity, what are the identity elements? Addi um, uh, uh, 
additive and multiplicative. So the zero element is what? What behaves like zero? What ordered pair behaves like zero? Zero, one, very good. The class of zero, one. Actually, yeah, so it's not just this, it's the class zero, one. Okay, which consists of a bunch of representatives. The, the multiplicative identity is what? Yeah, one over one. Okay. And uh, you can check all these properties. Check these axioms hold. Okay, and you know enough to do that now. You'd have to go to, to basically to back to ordered pairs and check them, but you can check that they do. Now, uh, this is a, uh, a structure which occurs in many places, and particularly the later we'll see the real numbers also are a field, okay? Are the integers a field? What properties do the integers not satisfy? Why are the integers not a field? Good. Z is not a field um, because it does not satisfy what? M5 in, in particular. Jenny. Oh, yes, sorry, thank you. Um, this should say, uh, if you're watching at home, uh, on your slide, M5, uh, the last uh, line should say, every element except zero has a multiplicative inverse. Thank you. That is a typo. Okay, so Q is a field. Uh, and the other thing that's, that's very interesting about Q is that not only is it a field, it's, it's an ordered field. Q is an ordered field. And despite what the name implies, it, it, an ordered field is not just a set that is both a field and has an order. What else would you like to be true about an ordered field besides the fact that it's an ordered set that, that is a field? What else would you like to be true? Let me give you a hint. Um, Let's see, we have this other structure that has two operations, and that's nice, that's fine, except the operations should somehow play with each other, right? Nicely. And they do, with distribution. Okay, that's, that's what, a, a, it, with a field, you have these set with these two operations that play together nicely. Okay, here is now a set that has these two structures. It's got an order, and it's, it's a field. What else would you hope to be true? that the order and the field properties do what? Play nicely. Okay, good. So it's an ordered field. Um, so what is that? It's a field with an order. So that, well, how would you like the order and the field properties to play nice with each other? What would you suggest? There are two operations to a field. Maybe I want to know how um, they relate to the ordering. For instance, so that two things are true. Well, here the, the way to say it is the order is preserved in some sense by uh, the field operations. Okay, and I'm going to put this in quotes and then tell you what I really mean, which is. Uh, if y is less than z, this implies that what happens if I add x to both sides? How do you think x plus y and x plus z should relate? Less than x plus z. That's the first property, comma. And the second property is if y is less than z and x is less than, and x is bigger than zero, Second property should say how multiplication relates. This should imply that what? X. XY is less than XZ. Notice that we are demanding that the, the thing you multiply be positive. Okay? 
uh, I'll, I'll mention that this is slightly different than what's written in your book. Your book has, I'll call this two prime, your book has a condition that is uh, slightly different but equivalent. And I encourage you to read what the book says and see why it's equivalent. Okay, but this is the way I like to think about it because it, it makes it very clear you're trying to have the order be preserved by the field operations. Okay, just got to be careful about positive factors here. Okay. Hmm, okay. So, um, what do we have now? We have uh, Q being an ordered field, uh, which is, is uh, basically says something about uh, its structure. Okay, so um, here's where we're heading now. Um, we're heading towards constructing the real numbers. And our, our hope is that maybe, so this will be next time. Our hope is that maybe the real numbers, whatever they are, uh, might be good enough to solve the algebraic equation, x squared equals 2, as well as other things. And, uh, and hopefully they will um, uh, also somehow contain the rationals. So in some sense, they extend the rationals. So they'll extend the rationals in some sense, so Q. And what else will they do? Well, they will also uh, have the, not only will they have the property that they'll solve equations like x squared equals 2, but they will in some sense fill in the holes in the, in, uh, in the line, uh, the number line that we uh, began to get a picture of. So it will be also an ordered field, but it will have a property that we'll call complete. So it'll be what's called a complete ordered field. Okay, so it will live on a line, like a number line, but it won't have the holes that the rationals do. The rationals don't solve the, the equation x squared equals 2, even though we know that's the length. That's the length of a hypotenuse of a triangle with two sides that are uh, unit length, okay? So that's next time, that's lecture three, which will be on Friday, okay? Have a great day.